I've been looking forward to this guest speaker for quite a while. When I read in the MAC paper that Elaine and Dan had given this program for some group, I thought, well, they should be giving that for historical society. So I immediately called Elaine, but you know Elaine and Homer are always gone somewhere. So it took until now to nail her down. And we're very, very happy that Elaine is going to tell us about some little known secrets of Yamhill County. I cannot believe what's happening to the Yamhill County Historical Society. Do you remember last <coughs> month there were a bunch of red-nosed Rudolphs that took over the whole meeting? And then, do you know what we're going to do tonight? We're going to tell secrets. And here is the very first one. Once upon a time, not so long ago, there were some rather questionable get-rich-quick propositions in Yamhill County. Well, Yamhill County, as you know, never had a gold rush, but there were some hints of some big money-making uh, projects of another kind. And mostly these indications were up in the northern part of the county. And so Dan, on the map of Yamhill County, is going to give you an indication of where these were. Are we... Are we Gold mines. Gold mines. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> uh, do we have a map of Yamhill County up there? And are you and you've shown? Okay, fine. Right. Do you want me to point something out? Yeah. And you're you're going to, going to show where the money making projects were up in the northern part of the county. Okay. Okay. And and um, incidentally, as early as 1891, Yamhill County residents began <laughs> dreaming that instead of gold rush country, they might be in coal and iron country when they read some exciting news in the telephone mm -hmm. register. And back in 1891, you wouldn't have had to have, you couldn't have had a car, so you would have had to get a horse and buggy to go up and investigate this get rich quick proposition. And so uh, Dan is going to show you a picture of where you would have gone up in North Yamhill County to rent the team and the buggy, the horse and the buggy, to, uh, to go up and investigate this get rich quick proposition. And this is the 1891 telephone register news story that might have prompted you to go out and investigate. Quote, in the office of C. Talmadge of McMinnville can be seen a sample of iron ore picked up in the Red Hills north of Lafayette. All that is needed is a little enterprise and Yamhill County can be the center of iron and coal of the northwest coast. And then, in 1892, there was this telephone register story. A syndicate has obtained an option on the James Green Place near Lafayette, and they will prospect for coal. It would be no surprise if a 10-foot vein of the purest coal was found, as the county is undoubtedly full of both coal and iron." Unquote. And then, in 1901, Yamhill County residents began thinking more get-rich-quick thoughts with regard to coal and now oil. As per this news, a telephone register story read, The drill machine has been ordered for drilling for oil by H.E. Follett, on whose land the Yamhill oil prospect is. He is surely the happiest man in all of Yamhill County. And there is still a chance to purchase a small block of stock. If you want to do the square thing by your own locality and take the chance of becoming wealthier than you are now, subscribe to a few shares of this stock. A lady of Portland invested $5 in a California oil company a couple of years ago, and when the well was sold to Standard Oil Company, her share of the price was $65,000. Yam Hill, the story says, is a little slow in starting, but she generally ends well. 
Well, in a story later in 1901, the telephone register noted that the Yamio Coal and Oil Company had indeed ordered a machine capable of going down 2,500 feet. And the TR added, quote, profits are not only possible, but probable. Big money is to be made in new industries before development. We cannot force you in. We can only state the possibility. Urge your consideration and bank on your good judgment. Well, next the telephone register reported that Yamhill Coal and Oil would start drilling early the following month. It added, the amount of their capital stock and the number of acres under control ensures hundreds of dollars for everyone invested. And the TR added, when success is assured, a dead man cannot see this, but others should. And the Newberg graphic said, the stock is now selling at 50 cents a share with a certainty of a raise in price soon. Now, here's a photo, Dan's going to show a photo of that coal mine because it did become actuality. And there, as you can see, is the, is the proof of the coal mine up in northern Yamhill County. And then there was this encouraging follow-up. The latest report for the North Yamhill coal mine is to the effect that the quality of coal is getting better all the time and that the railroad has agreed to build a spur to the mine as soon as sufficient coal is ready to ship. And now Dan's going to show you another photo of the, uh, of the tunnel up at the coal mine in case you want to go up there and investigate making um, an investment. Well, we aren't sure what happened in the next few years, but at any rate, a bituminous coal mine was in production in 1904 and it produced for several years. But it is a bit of a secret as to when he, whether any millionaires resulted from it. But then, the next happening at the coal mine was a fire and it burned for several days. And today, there is no evidence of that Yamhill County get-rich-quick possibility. There's not a sign of that coal mine today. Now, let's go to another get-rich-quick proposition in Yamhill County that's centered about the St. Joseph area, about three miles east of McMinnville. You know where the St. Joe underpass is when you're taking Highway 99W toward Portland, and uh, it goes under the railroad tracks there, and there's also a St. Joe road, and Dan is showing you where this area is in case you didn't know. Well, this get-rich-quick possibility up in that area had its beginnings in 1872, and St. Joseph was started and named by Ben Holliday. He was a financier and railroad builder, and this St. Joseph in McMinnville's backyard was to be an important railroad town and the terminus of Holliday's West Side Oregon Central Railroad. Well, Holiday had big dreams for this St. Joseph site, and in 1872, he and a couple of others filed articles of incorporation for the Oregon Real Estate Company. And out there, where there are mostly dairy farms, or mostly farms today, they platted a town that included 74 blocks with 10 lots per block. And the town began to grow offering another get, Yam Hill County get rich quick proposition because now you had the opportunity to speculate on buying land up there at St. Joe. Well, in its heyday, St. Joseph it is, it is estimated had about 150 houses and numerous businesses and stagecoaches from McMinnville and Lafayette and Dayton would meet the train there at St. Joseph and take the passengers wherever they wanted to go. And there was a two-story hotel where people could stay at, who came from the east to look at these lots with the idea of buying. And incidentally, a lot of these uh, lots were sold but never were built on. Well, these railroad developers first planned to build the railroad to St. Joseph bypass McMinnville and then continue on down the valley. But then 
They ran out of money, and for eight years, that train went only as far as St. Joseph, and out there on the outskirts of McMinnville, on turntables, the train turned around and proceeded back to Portland. But then a dreadful thing happened. Henry Villard took over management of the railroad, and McMinnvillans successfully lobbied to have the railroad go through their town. So the railroad backed out of St. Joseph, abandoning that little town, and cutting across just one small corner of the original plat. And this town that was supposed to rival McMinnville lived for only about 10 years. And going back to that St. Joseph Hotel, after the town died, the hotel was unceremoniously dragged on skids by horses up to Lafayette, and it was in operation there until it burned. And this is a photo of the hotel circa 1914 after it was moved to Lafayette. Then, about the turn of the century, St. Joseph had another chance at greatness when two companies were formed to sell land in that area. St. Joseph Orchard Homes sold lots, not only in person, but by mail order. And some buyers never saw the land before purchase. Mostly these plots were five to 10 acres and they were planted to fruit trees, primarily cherry and, and pear trees. And if buyers desired, St. Joseph Orchard Homes managed the orchards for absentee owners and they took care of the trees and they harvested the fruit and they sent owners their share of the profits. But as with the get rich coal offers, the, the fruit, the old timers recall that the owners often received little on their investment and that the trees did not always receive the best of care. Now, if you didn't get, rich, get, quick rich on, get rich quick on either of these deals, there was another chance to do so. Up at St. Joe, during President Franklin Roosevelt's administration, the federal government bought about 1,500 acres in the St. Joseph area to use for resettlement purposes. And the land was divided into small dairy farms and WPA workers built houses and garages and barns on the plots that sold for about $100 an acre. Today, about the only remaining remnants of St. Joseph are the St. Joseph School Building that's visible from Highway 99W about a mile west of Lafayette. And Dan is going to point out where this location is. You may not have noticed it, but it's visible from Highway 99, and it's no from Highway 99W, and it's no longer used for a school. It ceased being used as a school in 1933, but then it became a private residence. And there are some other memories of the St. Joe area. Olive Mary Johnson, whom many of you know, still lives in the St. Joe area. And in 1920, her parents, George and Elsie Warmington, bought the entire platted area of the original St. Joe and operated a dairy farm. And frequently they'd find wells used by St. Joe's first residents. And in the cornfield in front of their house was an oil slick. And that was apparently where the oil had been changed in the train's engine. And the corn never grew as tall there as it, as it did elsewhere in the field. And they found evidence of old St. Joe, of, of St. Joe's old brickyards, one of the town's industries, and scrap iron, apparently where the blacksmith shop had been. And they, had, they found lots of crockery shards and they attributed that to the saloons that had been at St. Joe. Well, the, the Warmingtons built their home on the site of that hotel at St. Joe, which had been shaded by four giant maples. And today, three of those majestic big leaf maples still stand, and they have been designated as heritage trees, which are, and are part of the Yamhill County Heritage Tree Program, and I think that's attributable, and thanks to George Williams, right? Didn't, okay. <laughs> now, now, here's another Yamhill County secret. A hundred years ago, Yamhill County and surrounding area just abounded in fish and game. And Dan's going to show you some evidence of this. 
First, this first photo is of a 1921 bear hunt in Gopher Valley, north of Sheridan. And then he's going to show you a, a photo of a fish catch in Willamina. And then there is another photo of some more bear hunters on Main Street in Sheridan. And today, we wonder what's happened to that past game, and maybe the secret is overkill. Listen to this. Back in 1892, the telephone register reported that the run of salmon on the Nehalem was the best in years, and that 200 could be killed in a day. The story said that all that could be taken were salted and dried. And there was this hunting story. Quote, Martin Rogers, Cook, Heath, and the Chinaman returned from woods Friday last, loaded to the gunnels with snipe and duck. And in 1888, there was this newspaper account. Frank Rogers is leaving for a two-week duck hunt on the Columbia, and he intends to ship what he kills to the city in piano boxes. In 1891, a TR story noted, duck are plentiful on the river, and our sports are enjoying themselves with bags of from 25 to 50. And in 1893, this hunting story, two hunters in one day killed 102 snipe at Wapato Lake. And another news story, China pheasant are plentiful, and large numbers are being killed. So maybe the secret as to the decrease in the number of our fish and game isn't such a secret after all. And do you know the secret of how Linfield College got its name? Well, Linfield College, as you probably know, started out as McMinnville College, and then it, when it was chartered in 1858, it started out as McMinnville College. And here is a photo, of one of the photos of early McMinnville College. Then, in 1922, the widow of George Fisher Linfield deeded to the college a quarter million dollars worth of property with a proviso that it be named for her husband, and thus it became Linfield. And Dan is going to show you three more photos of the, of the early college, and he's going to end up with one of Pioneer Hall. <laughs> And when we get to the one of Pioneer Hall, this four-story Pioneer Hall was built of brick construction in 1882 at a cost of $30,000. And when it was first built, it housed all of the college activities. And then in 1946, it was rebuilt at a cost of 130000 a hundred thousand more than it cost originally, but it was a real tricky rebuilding job. For that work, the, the workmen had to cut holes in the roof and the ceiling, and then they dropped upright steel pillars through the roof to support the new construction. Incidentally, Ralph Friedman in his book, uh, Search for Western Oregon, says Pioneer Hall probably is the most historic uh, college structure in all of Oregon. And here's another secret about the college. You know Samuel Lancaster, uh, the esteemed engineer who laid out the old Columbia River Highway? Well, he also planned and laid out the Linfield or the McMinnville College campus. And while we're telling stories about Linfield College, here's another. Reverend Leonard Riley, who was president of the McMinnville College for a long time, for about a quarter of a century, during the time that Linfield, the, the college was having grave financial troubles, uh, was its leader, and he put Linfield, the college, back on its feet. Well, he had a yin to be buried under his office window at Melrose. And after Harry Dillon became president, Reverend Wiley asked if that would be possible. Well, he was given that permission, and there, under the northeast corner of Melrose Hall, are the graves of Reverend Wiley and his wife, Julia. Now, here's another Yamhill County mystery. Why did Lafayette, the first town in Yamhill County, in 1846, once a prestigious town, Boomtown, why did it die on the vine? 
Well, here is a photo of that early town uh, when it was a bit busier, perhaps, than it is now. And in 1840, listen to all of the reasons that made, Lin, that made uh, Lafayette a really uh, promising young town. In 1846, the first court session in Yamhill County was held in Lafayette outdoors under an oak tree. And they called it the Council Oak for a time. That tree isn't standing any longer, however. The first circuit court in Oregon convened in Lafayette in 1847. And listen to this, about 1848, the first United States court in the Pacific Northwest sat in session at Lafayette. Lafayette was the first county seat, of course, and a $14,000 courthouse was built there about 1859. And here is a photo of that fine structure. When gold was discovered in California, Lafayette really took off. It had some 30 businesses, at one time more than Portland, and it was a major town in western Willamette Valley. It was a starting point for the prospectors leaving for the gold fields, and it was also the starting point for the pack trains that were taking produce and supplies down to the gold miners. And here you'll see a photo of one of Lafayette's early businesses. But then Lafayette began to wane and some attribute it to a curse imposed by the mother of an accused Lafayette murderer. In 1886, one morning, Lafayette's 600 residents awakened to a murder in their town. A Lafayette merchant, D.I. Corker, aged 57, had been brutally killed and dismembered with an ax. Corker had a store that carried hardware and caskets and he lived in adjoining quarters, and when someone broke into the store, Corker apparently awakened, and in the ensuing struggle, he was brutally murdered. Well, Sheriff Jeff Harrison, according to the telephone register, reportedly grabbed a no-good town tough by the name of Gus Marple, largely on circumstantial evidence, although the sheriff said he followed a peculiar boot track from the site of the scene of the crime to Marple's place. Well, at any rate, Marple was found guilty and he was sentenced to be hanged and by then Lafayette didn't have a hanging tree anymore. The gallows were adjacent to courthouse. Well, neither the sheriff or his deputy, Ben Collard, wanted to drop the trap on Marple because of that circumstantial evidence. It, that, were, that was his, the reason that he was convicted. And reportedly, the sheriff tried to pass the duty to the deputy, and the deputy flatly refused. Well, then, Marco made a grievous error. He accused the sheriff of killing Corker and planning Marco's hanging as a cover-up. And that reportedly made the sheriff so mad that he then sprang the trap. And all the while, Marple's mother was watching her son about to be hanged. And as he was led to the gallows, she screamed a curse at the executioners and a curse on the town. She shrieked a warning that Lafayette would be ravaged three times by fire. And in truth, Lafayette did wane and fade. And it was virtually wiped out twice by fire. It lost the railroad to McMinnville, it lost the county seat, and the first bank in the county went to McMinnville, and that bank was important. That bank of McMinnville was the first bank on the west side of the Willamette Valley between Portland and Eugene, and I, there's a secret about that bank, and I think the, that Dan has a photo of it, I think. <laughs> and anyhow, if he does, the, uh, the owners of this bank, Jacob Wortman and sons, John and Chris, ordered a safe for the bank, but then the, the opening date originally was postponed because the safe hadn't arrived. Well, when it finally did reach the McMinnville train depot, there was a problem of how to get it to the bank. It was then winter and the McMinnville streets were mud, mud, mud. So the safe couldn't be brought by wagon because the weight of the safe would have caused the wagon to sink practically out of sight. 
So the safe was finally moved on a large dolly and brought down the wooden sidewalks. But the safe was so heavy that it broke many of the boards in the sidewalk and the first expense incurred by the bank was $50 for repairs of the broken sidewalks. <laughs> and now I want to tell you another secret. Do you know where that safe is today? Well, I didn't get a chance to confirm this, but I'm pretty sure it's in the, in the um, Metal Farm Implement Museum up at Lafayette. Can it, I knew if Ed Rogue here was here, he could confirm that. But I think it's, it used to be right inside of the door, and I'm pretty sure that that is the, the safe that was originally in the, in the first bank here in Yamhill County. Well, before I go on, incidentally, I'd like to mention that all of the photos that you're seeing here today or tonight are, of course, Yamhill County Historical Society photos. And Dan is responsible for assembling and cataloging these photos, which are a terrific resource. So thanks so much to Dan for showing them tonight. <laughs> now, back to secrets. Yamhill County has all kinds of mysterious secrets and one pertains to flying saucers. And Dan has a front page story in the, he has a copy of the news of the telephone register on which this story appeared and he can send it around if, uh, if you'd like. It's a little hard for you to see it back there. But uh, you no doubt have heard of the story of McMinnville's flying saucer and it was a result of the snapshots that are shown on the front page of that paper that were taken by the Paul Trench Route 3 McMinnville and they are believed by some to be the first authentic photos of so-called flying saucers. Well, Trent and his wife, Evelyn, were in their backyard on May 11, 1950, about 7.45 one night, when they saw an object coming toward them. It was very bright, almost silvery, made no noise, emitted no smoke, and n neither one could guess as to its side, size, speed, or distance. Well, with the appearance of these UFO photos, the attention of the ni entire nation seemed focused on, on McMinnville's 6,500 residents. The TR was inundated with calls and requests for copies of the paper, and it promised that it would provide a copy if people would send a letter requesting it and enclose a dime. Well, 1,100 requests were received in one day, and the dimes were attached with everything from scotch tape to band-aids. And newsmen and photographers, including Time Life staffers, descended on the town, and the Trents were flown to New York and they appeared on We the People radio program and the television show. Well, controversy raged as to whether these snapshots, which became famous in the annals of ufology, were real or a hoax. And in the book, UFO Enigma by Menzel and Taves, published in 1977, they advise, quote, the Trent sightings remain one of the favorites of the believers, unquote. 54 years after this happening, requests still are occasionally received by the NR for copies of the paper. But whether the Trent snapshots are hoaxes or genuine still may be a, sec a mystery, but this is a secret of how that controversy was born. And now, let's switch from Yamhill County Airways to the secret of a county waterway, the Yamhill River. Well, you probably know that there is a Lafayette Locks County Park, and maybe you've had picnics there. Well, if so, you perhaps have wondered why, if it's called Lafayette Locks Park, there isn't any locks there. Well, back in the early days, before there were roads, rivers were, of course, the means of getting crops to the market. So the yam here was very important in, this, um, in the development of this area. And the first steamboats then began to appear on the Yam Hill in 1851, and steamers came to haul grain out of Dayton, which was really a busy port. And Dan has a couple of photos of showing you the activity at Dayton. And the first one is of grain being loaded there at Dayton on the Yam Hill. And then there's another one of grain 
being unloaded from, unlo the grain is being unloaded from a steamboat there in Dayton. Well, busy Dayton had grain warehouses and by 1868, a flour mill and a sawmill and two boats were coming every day, coming to Dayton and departing. And here are two more photos of steamers that chugged into Dayton. This first one is the steamer relief on the Dayton waterfront. And then after the relief is gone, we're gonna see one of the Organa that was coming to Dayton also. It was said that payments in gold to farmers for the wheat and, they fl and flour brought here to Dayton ran as high as $50,000 per day. But low water could be a challenge for the boat captains on the Amhill, and if the water was low, even at Dayton, they might have to back up their boats to an eddy so they could swing the boat in and then get headed again in the right direction. And low water was even more of a problem at Lafayette and McMinnville. They could make it to McMinnville only when the water was high enough for them to get over the falls near Lafayette. And even though those falls were only three or four feet high, they posed a real problem to navigation for McMinnville. But on June 3, 1896, the federal government approved $69,000 for construction of locks and dam on the Yam Hill. And here are three photos of uh, the locks while that construction was taking place. That was a really big project for Yamhill County. And when they were finished, there was a gala opening in September 1900 with parade and speeches. And the steamer Bonita made trips from McMinnville to the locks. And Dan is going to show you a photo of that Bonita. And just think, if you had been in McMinnville then, you could have gotten on this Bonita and ridden all the way from Lafayette up to McMinnville on that festive day. And then Dan's going to show us some more photos of the locks, three more photos of the locks, and there's going to be one of a steamer that's in, that is in the locks. But there was a problem with regard to this project, high water. High water closed the locks for 78 days that first year, and it did damage amounting to 23,000. And that 23,000 represents a third of what the entire project cost. Well, the next year, high water closed the locks for 79 days. And then, in 1902, the regular run of steamboat traffic above the locks came to an end. And for fiscal year ending June 30th, 1904, there were only 34 lockages and none for steamers. The freight included 48 tons of gravel and one ton of crawfish. And so about 50 years after that gala opening, the Army Corps of Engineers issued this final report, quote, Due to lack of use by commercial traffic, Yam Hill Lock was discontinued February 7, 1954. The property was transferred to Yam Hill County January 16, 1959, and it became Lafayette Locks Park. Four years later, the Timber Crib Dam was adjudged to be a barrier to fish migration, and the dam was then breached. And that explains the Lafayette Locks Park secret and why when you picnic there today, you won't see any locks. And do you know the secret about McMinnville City Hall? Well, if you don't, it's really the former Louis Cordemanche residence. And back in the 1940s, the Cordemanche name was really well known in McMinnville. And they owned a, hard, they owned a hardware store on 3rd Street and a farm implement store a block or so north of 3rd. And when the family moved to the Portland area, the city bought their home and it became a distinctive, beautiful city hall. Now, in Yamhill County, there's a little community, Whiteson, that you pass on the way to Amity, you know, and it's keeping secrets from you. It once was quite a railroad center and a bustling town. 
It was named for Henry White, who bought 300 acres in that area, and a post office was established in 1889 at this town that was first called White's, and then later the name was changed to Whiteson. Well, White subdivided his property, and then the narrow gauge railroad built right through his land. In fact, Whiteson had two trains a day, the narrow gauge line from Portland to Airlie in Polk County and the standard gauge line from Portland to Corvallis. So people often stopped in Whiteson to change trains. And here are a couple of photos of that railroad town, Whiteson, and of its railroad depots. And a hotel was built there in Whiteson to accommodate travelers who did stay in town overnight. And after we see the railroad depots, we're going to see a photo of that Hotel Whiteson. Heinz, <laughs> oh, <it's in> a, <laughs> a oh, oh, yeah. And then Heinz History of Oregon notes, Whiteson is a beautiful town site, now having a hotel and a few stores. And now Dan is going to show us a photo of one of those Whiteson businesses, the P.K. <laughs> We're going to get to that. It's a um, P.K. Nissen's dry goods store, and uh, it's um, no. no, nope. <laughs> well, well, anyhow, we'll to go on. Whiteson even had a newspaper, the Whiteson Leader. But today, the trains don't stop at Whiteson. It has no school, no post office, no bank, and as far as is known, there's not a single business in Whiteson. So that's the secret of Whiteson, the railroad town. Now, here's what may be a secret to you as to the names uh, of um, McMinnville Streets. Well, once upon a time, McMinnville Cross Streets were designated by the letters of the alphabets, A Street, B Street, C Street, and so on. And um, we, now, yeah, now this is a photo that shows the third street area of McMinnville circa about the 1920s. But in 1928, the McMinnville Council made a great decision and it replaced those letters with the names of McMinnville history makers, such as Sebastian Adams, who do the plans for our town. And here is a photo of the home that Sebastian built in 1858 at 615 Baker Street. The house is no longer there. <laughs> so, there. And um, the house um, was built, as I say, at 615 Baker Street, but it was replaced in the 1940s by apartments. And Baker Street in uh, McMinnville, of course, was named for John Gordon Baker, another history maker, and he erected the first home in the vicinity of McMinnville, and here is his home. It was over on the West Side Road, north of town. And do you know the secret of how Michael Book Lane in McMinnville got its name? Well, it was named for Francie and Christy Michael Book who were dairy farmers and raised turkeys on their land. And that land now includes Michael Book Country Club, of course. Well, when Michael Book Country Club came into being in 1964, the clubhouse was in the old, old Michael Book dairy barn, and sometimes in warm weather, the odors reminded members of such. But the, dairy, but the dairy barn clubhouse burned down in November 1973, and a new clubhouse was built. And the stately two-story house that the Michael Books, Books had lived in was moved over to the Linfield College campus, and it's now the admissions building. Now here are some quickie secrets. How many of you know what happened to uh, the Yamhill County town of North Yamhill? Well, I'll bet you a lot of you do. But in 1908, the city fathers of North Yamhill decided to drop the name North and just call it Yamhill. And here are photos of the way North Yamhill looked about that time. This is Maple Street, about 1900. And then we're going to see another street scene of North Yamhill that was taken about the same time. 
And incidentally, do you know what famous author, especially of children's books, lived in the uh, interesting house at the west end of 3rd Street in Yam Hill? Well, Beverly Cleary is that author, and she's still writing today. As a child, she lived in that 19th century house with a mansard roof, and if you haven't seen that, just drive by some day and, day and take a look at it. It's a, it's a beautiful home. What's more, Yam Hill for a while also was the home of Mary Pickford, if that rings a bell with any of you who know about the silent film era. Anyhow, Mary Pickford, as a little girl, lived up in, in North Yam Hill, and her mother, Mrs. Smith, taught primary grades there. Now, there's another area of Yam Hill County that's keeping secrets from you. Just about all of you, I'm sure, have taken the Wheatland Ferry, and had you been a wheat farmer in the area of uh, circa the 1880s, you could have hitched up your team and hauled your wheat to this uh, bustling town of Wheatland. Well, Wheatland was an important Willamette River shipping point, and Daniel Matheny, not long after he bought his claim in 1844, started a ferry service here at this site, and a post office was established in January 1867, and when you brought your wheat here, you could have had a lively time. It had warehouses, store, schools, but then the floods were unkind to Wheatland. The 1890 flood ravaged the town. And we don't have any photos of Wheatland, but Dan is going to show you one of the flood in Dayton that same year, and that give you, gives you an idea of how devastating that high water was. Maybe not. <laughs> <laughs> and with the coming of the railroads, the steamboats faded into oblivion, and so did the bustling port of Wheatland. Well, has anyone told you the secret of what happened to Pacific College that once was in Yamhill County? Well, Pacific College in Newburgh in 1949 became George Fox College. It was started as an academy in 1885 by the Friends or the Quaker Church, and it became Pacific College in 1893, and then it became George Fox. And here's a photo of Pacific College about 1898, and then there are a couple more that Dan's going to show us of that school up in, up in Newburgh. Well, this school's first president was Dr. H.J. Minthorn, and he was the uncle of former President Herbert Hoover. And in 1884, young Bertie Hoover, Hoover, 10 years old then, and an orphan, came to Newburgh to live with his aunt, Aunt Laura and Uncle Henry. Well, Bertie arrived in Portland by train from Iowa, and his Uncle Henry was there with a team and buggy at the station to meet him, and they headed out for Newburgh, and Aunt Laura and her daughters were busy there, and they were making pear butter out in the yard at the house here where they lived in um, Newburgh. And Dan is going to show you a photo of that uh, Edwards house. In, it was first originally the Edwards house before the Minthorns lived in it. And of course now it's the Minthorn Museum, the Hoover Museum. But um, at any rate, um, when Hoover, when Hoover got to uh, Newburgh, his Aunt Laura told him that he could have all of the pears that he wanted to eat. Well, Bertie had never tasted pears before, and he liked them. He thought they were just great. And so, for the next few days, he, little, he ate little else but pears, with the result that he became so ill that Uncle Henry had to carry Bertie upstairs and put him to bed. And therein is the secret of why Herbert Hoover did not eat pears again for many years. <laughs> and that's enough secrets for now. But if you should want to know more secrets about Yamhill County and all sorts of other interesting information, Dan is going to show you a photo of where to go. Just go to our Yamhill County Museums in Lafayette and they'll reveal to you more secrets than you can shake a stick at. Fascinating secrets galore. And so with that, thanks a lot for sharing secrets.